talk is about uh, resiliency in general, but a lot of other things that we could do in combination between engineering and um, you know, School of Public Health. So I basically threw in as many uh, things that I could. Hopefully, I could keep it interesting and informative. And we could find some common ground that uh, we could uh, collaborate. So as a part of uh, the, the work that I do, is also I work with the Center for Sustainable Smart Cities. It's actually right here in UAB. And hopefully with this uh, center, we could bring some ideas together, some collaboration, and we could work together on a lot of topics that could help us to um, assist with the um, movement overall toward urbanization and cities and you know, help with uh, common issues that we may have. So the main goal or the main area or the main tool that I you know, use for research is, is remote sensing. And the reason for that is currently we have over 200 satellites, believe it or not, looking at planet Earth. And added to that, now we have drones, we have small sensors, we have wearable sensors. So with all those, there are a lot of information that are coming our way that we could use for various purposes. One of those <clears throat> that actually you've probably been following with the story in is basically now the storm resiliencies. But in general, these are the applications of these sensors, satellites and drones. They could actually help with the climate change, disasters, energy, health, <coughs> urban planning, water, and a lot of different other sectors that could use this information. Sometimes maybe you're not exposed to it, but these information are available. And mainly, we should be able to do something about you know, scenarios like this that happen now you know, too often. And it's now front and center. So the first part that I'm going to um, talk about what we can do and how we could help these communities that they're very vulnerable. And you may ask why we are so vulnerable and what is the source of that vulnerability? Why are we so scared about all these incoming storms these days? So we couldn't even pick a better time. We had this Dorian, we asked a lot of people to evacuate and move and mobilize. And it's, it's causing a lot of pain. You know, even if not, you're not on the path or you're not being impacted, all that basic movement and asking you to leave the area, leave your home, is basically a challenge. But what is the key component here? Why we are so vulnerable? So if you want to look at this list, you see that we have a lot of communities that they are very near water. We are at low elevation. We have a lot of key facilities. And also we have two other issues that they're not helping with all these ongoing events. One is climate change and sea level rise. And the other one is change of precipitation pattern. And again, that is induced by climatic activities. So this is the projection for that sea level rise that we are going to see an increased impact because then it will provide a better platform for that landfall to have significantly more impact. And the other issue is in the United States, we are not lucky to have a buffer zone that comes through in a steep continental shelf. This is what you can see in places like Europe. If you go to, for example, to the UK and the city of Dover, you see that the city is actually right on top of the mountain. There's a good amount of buffer available. But what we have in the US is a shallow continental shelf, especially the East Coast. That means every inch of rise in this water means significantly more impact on the current structures that we have. But why this is more of an issue? Why now? So in hydrology, we talk about this that when you're looking at the Q, which is the amount of flow that you have, versus the time that it takes for that one to come in, basically is impacted by your surface. We have converted a lot of that land that used to take in up to 100% sometimes of that water and cause no excess water, which basically causes that runoff to basically become that areas that they're not absorbing any most of that water remains on the surface, and they all rush to the outlet. You may ask, oh, maybe we have enough outlets. What's that issue? Yes, this room has two doors. Right after this presentation, we just walk out. 
But imagine just the alarm goes off and we have to all go at the same time. The size of the two doors are not enough. And that's exactly what is happening. We have a shorter duration for all that water trying to get to the outlets. And that's why less than an hour of basically a rainfall, you see flood, which was a very rare scenario. It used to take a longer time, most of it be absorbed, but now that's not the case. In addition, none of the global scenarios are helping us. In some areas, we see 20% to 30% more precipitation, and we are seeing drought in some other parts, but in the parts that they're already having issues, this is going, going to get even worse. One of the things that I wanted to do, as Peter mentioned, being scattered, is not only just looking at the engineering side of it, but also at the economics of that resilience. I'll talk about resilience and what is resiliency about. But it's very hard to convince people to take action if there's no conversation about the economics of it. So what I have here is basically the findings of the National Institute of Building Sciences that every dollar spent on mitigation saves the nation $6 in return in the future. And that's massive when you want to put it into a context of a large city. So right after Sandy in 2012, it hit the city of New York. It caused massive damage. We looked at eight of 14 wastewater treatment plants in the city of New York. To just give you a sense, 13 out of 14 were impacted during Sandy. And the two rivers, East River and Hudson River, saw the worst environmental disaster during that time. Because those two cities, basically the city, with all their plants, they are a combined sewer overflow system where you have the rainwater and also the sewer goes to the same place. Basically overwhelmed the system, they had to open the gates, actually massively impacted the rivers. But we looked at eight of them and we saw under a very small scenario, these eight wastewater treatment plants would see $126 million in damage. Wouldn't that be wise to spend a fraction of it for resiliency to not have to go through it. The other sector that we looked at where was, you know, very important to people, that was transportation. During Sandy, 31 subway entrances, 88 miles of road, uh, railroads, and 80 miles of highway were flooded. What I wanted to do was to compare it to other scenarios because we knew what would happen under a category one or a two or a three and a four. But when I compared Sandy to other categories, I saw something strange. So to give you a sense, Sandy, when he hit city of New York, had a wind speed of around 50 miles per hour. In order to be a category one, you need 74 miles per hour of wind speed. So, on a meteorological scale, you had a kitty storm, got a fancy name of a super storm, left the damage behind than a category one storm. How is that possible? You're missing 25 miles per hour of wind alone. Momentum is not even enough. Why would leave a damage behind? All the students in the room, think about it. You're missing a massive momentum but it damaged more than a category one. How's that possible? You get into a fight with somebody to tell you that the maximum punch that he can throw is probably 100 pounds. And you get knocked down the first round and you felt that 400 pounds of punch hit your face. Well, somebody lied to you. And that's exactly what happened. So American Society of Civil Engineers, they put out these reports every year. What it tells you, it tells you what is the current state of this infrastructure. We get Ds and D minuses and C, and we're like, okay, who cares? You know, I, I got those in college. It never impacted me as much. <laughs> <coughs> but that is the case. You get a D, and you have a small, small storm coming your way, leaving a massive damage behind. Your house, your structure, your system was not ready. And the other thing is, 
we have looked at all these events in a vacuum, like a singular event, storm surge, all right. high rain, high tide. Have you thought about what would have happened if all that happened in the same time? You had a massive storm coming and the rain stuck around for three days. I'm talking about Houston, yes. 48 inches of rain in less than three days. That's more than what Houston gets in one year. The average rainfall in Houston is 44 inches. Three days you get 48 inches. That's exactly what happens when the alarm goes off. We get all stuck here. And that is a scenario. So in order to avoid that for the first time, I basically put this together for my students, but we need to now look at total water levels. What all of those scenarios happen at the same time. Then you have a massive system like this, which is a wastewater treatment plant. In New Jersey alone, one of them, Passaic County Water Utility, has spent over $100 million in repairs. It took them six months to fix it. But you may ask, we have federal agencies that are doing something about it. FEMA generates maps. It basically marks different areas. This VE zone, AE zone, X zone. Well, let me tell you a little bit about it. So FEMA puts out these maps. So V zone says that your 100 year flood, that's your first round. E means this is already the basically being base flood elevation being established. This area has all the numbers that you know, they need. Also, you have AE zone. And then you get the X zone, which could be shaded which is within the 500 year flood zone and X unshaded is outside of your 100, 500 year flood zone. Look at that X zone. I wanna talk about that X zone. These people have been told that you're outside of a 500 year flood zone. You're okay and based on the National Flood Insurance Program, NFIP program, you do not even need to carry a flood insurance program. This is Mexico Beach, Florida. Hurricane Michael comes, this is the remainder. This is what's left. You may think, okay, what, what is it that FEMA are doing? Well, their purpose is not Mexico Beach or the downtown UAB or some areas. They're a federal agency. They're looking at regional and national levels. They're not responsible to be super accurate for one area. They're reporting to the president. They're looking at a national scale emergency. So there is a need for local planning. So that's what we wanted to do. So this is after Sandy in New Jersey, we got funding. And we wanted to do something different. Not only we wanted to look at the macro scale or even meso scale, what the communities can do, but I was focused about what could happen possibly at a very small scale for individual properties. As you could imagine, this is a massive data campaign. But luckily we were, in, we were in university and we had a lot of students that for extra credit and some extra fund in the form of summer internship, they could have done all that. That's exactly what we did. <laughs> for a smaller study area we had in New Jersey, we modeled that whole system. So here what you could see is as a storm comes up, how the basic scenarios change on the ground? Basically the surface elevation of that water, how does it change? and what areas go underwater first and second, and that could be the roadmap for us to study resiliency. You hear this term, we want to be resilient. What is it? Resiliency is the ability of a system to prepare for, withstand, recover from, and adopt to external shocks. So that's the entire goal that we have. We want to be able to basically go through it and bounce back as quick as we can. That's the goal. So just put it in, we, like graphs in engineering, things like that, and equations, right? So we wanted to understand the system in terms of graphs. So if this is the functionality of the system at 100%, the functionality drops after a shock to a minimum level. Let's say you go through you know, an accident, you're winded, it takes you a, at least a couple of minutes to get back, and then it will take you a while to come back out of this scenario. And one of the other things that we needed was detailed information about every single house in that system. When we studied that, we actually came across something a little bit strange. 
when we study natural disasters in engineering at least, uh, for us mostly we studied um, earthquakes. It's been studied for many years. We have massive national labs that they're not being used right now. So we need to talk basically to form a new understanding. So earthquakes usually go after very large buildings. We're talking about high rises. But when it comes to storms, their number one victim is very small, low rise, one story, two story family houses. One of the things that we wanted to understand was that impact. How would that impact the system that we have? And how does the cracks in the system happen? You have that external loading, how does the crack happen? And the other thing that we needed to understand resilience was the time of recovery. That's where the studies that are happening in the School of Public Health can come handy here. So I was thinking about how long it takes to recover from an external shock. So how long it takes to, for a one-story structure to be rebuilt? So I thought about it, okay, if that's the case, the time of recovery is equal to time of construction. Well, if that was the case, six, seven years after a lot of these events, we wouldn't have houses that they're still the same shape that it was the day after a storm. And then I noticed there are a lot of components involved. I had to put this together, that all right, if the funding is available, let's say that you have the money <coughs> in the bank, which is very rare, Yes, the time of recovery is equal to the time that it takes to rebuild that structure. Six months, seven months, four months, how much resources you have and whatnot. But if you're waiting for the insurance to pay, FEMA to come in, if not, you're waiting for charities to come in, it will elongate this path and it will take much longer. With all that information, we wanted to provide this. You may ask what this is. This is the damage and resiliency for every single house in that study area. Every time I show this, I get a chill. It never becomes easy. This is everything for these people. House is the largest investment a family makes. I do not intend to publish this map, and I do not intend to distribute this. But we need to know in the background what happens to these houses. You may ask, what are these colors? To just give you a sense, if you're green, you're in an area of less than 5% damage. Yellow, 5 to 25. Orange, 25 to 50. And if you're red, it means 50% or more damage. And that is total destruction. So this is every single house model. But wouldn't this be helpful that if they had this information individually and they knew how would they fare in terms of incoming storms? That would also avoid what I hate about these mass warning systems that it gets everybody on the road and eventually they get st stuck. No one gets anywhere. They're on the bridges and things like that. If we had to say that only these four or five houses in this row, you need to evacuate on this, this scenario. But also it would be good with all the information that we have to provide it to them that define a path toward resilience. How would you go from a red to an orange and yellow and hopefully become green? That's why we received some funding from National Science Foundation and developed this Q-peak. I'm going to geek out a little bit for you here. That Q-peak is at the top of that, the chart that I showed the massive the maximum of flood that you have. What this basically report is going to give is for every single house, it will show them what are the deficiency and what is it that needs to be done. You all know Carfax when you buy a used car, right? So see this one as house fax. <laughs> all the information you need to invest. And, and then you may, may think that, all right, you know what? I may use it, but who else would want it to use it? And then I'm going to hide it. Well, believe it or not, when you buy a house, the first owner of the house is the bank who gave you the money. Second one is the insurance company who insured that property and then that mortgage. And last one is me with my 5% standing there that would not be even counted. So whether we wanted to have it or not, 
we are already working with banks and insurance companies that they're trying to basically commercialize this one on the back end of it before they insure a property. And this, what this could possibly do is change that whole marketing feature, that how you view a waterfront property. Being an engineer and the purpose of this one was a decision making, we wanted to look at some other sectors that I'm going to go quickly through it. One was bridges. We got a lot of bridge failures. And especially in a lot of part of the country, you see this. What, you may ask, what's wrong with this? You see the clearance of the bridge from the surface of the water is not much. When you have a storm, this, the water level rises and it basically picks this deck up and unsets it. One of the things that we did for this community was, what are the number one priority bridges and they had to fix? And plus, we wanted to look at the scour, which is wash off that sand around the structure, causes a lot of damages, but these are rare. You have to be in a specific soil area that this could possibly happen. And these are the three of the products that was developed on that engineering side. And then next, I was like, all right, so it's not just the engineering side of it. What about a vulnerability? Who is vulnerable? So we looked, we looked at everything about that structure, that neighborhood, and everything about it. But what about the people in it? So when I was doing it, I looked at some of the vulnerability indices that they were out, and I was not happy about it. It was just mostly on the social part of it. But I was like, hey, what if happens that you're old and you're disabled, you cannot move, but you live in a structure that is very solid? Do you have to really? be mobilized in this case. And I work with people in social sciences to develop this. And the whole goal was to understand what are the social factors that could contribute to it, and who are the first level of priority for evacuation? Is it just the people that they're on the waterfront? Well, maybe they have the means of doing it, and they don't need the help. But you have 20 trucks, and you want to send out for that purpose. Where do you send it? And using that one, we were able to develop this, which is the map of that social vulnerability, plus everything on the engineering side and structural side of it, to provide a roadmap that where the 911 calls are coming from and where do you have to go and how to do it. And the last part was we have all these outdated evacuation maps, plus the mass warning system. It's not helpful. One of the things that I wanted to do was combine that, that water information with who has to basically leave the area and eventually what are the roads available and what's that dynamic evacuation. Let's say that you waited up to the last minute, you saw the CNN interviews, we are just going to wait out. And then what if at that point a lot of roads that are coming your way that they're already underwater. So that was the case and we used the same um, labels as a Google map. And if they basically obtain the app that we are basically have the better version, they could use it. And that's for dynamic evacuation, how to get out of it. There's one more thing in it is where to park your car during the storm. But believe it or not, during Sandy in just um, one state, we lost over 48,000 cars. 48,000 cars, just think about it. So during a storm, if you park your car, that app will uh, save your location. It will send you that uh, warning system. And this is how the whole system works together, but uh, we'll move on from it. And then we basically provided a full website that basically has a lot of the past information and also all the scenarios of um, what to do under various um, colors. So some, one of the other projects that we have done, we looked at the uh, road weather information system you know, and then how the roads could change around it. And one of the things that I have now been focused on is also the subsurface change of temperature. You may ask, okay, what, what, what is the source of this? So we have a lot of landfills, over 10,000 landfills around the country. A lot of these landfills, you know, maybe they're not even used and they're capped. But what happens is internally they're going through some changes. What happens is if they catch internally fire is smoldering, it will destroy the membrane, and it will leak to your groundwater system. And when it happens, you would never notice. And the last thing that basically comes out of it is the smoke, and that's probably a year or two years later, and that's already late. And you want to now send respond responders. That whole system can collapse. 
So we have been working with USDA, Department of Agriculture, for the past five years that they have been funding us that basically to develop a remote system, remote sensing system, use of drones and other technologies to develop that areas. The one that I'm showing you, this is Bridgestone Landfill in Missouri that um, has been basically burning for the past 10 years. They have spent over $200 million and we still don't know where it's going. And the unfortunate thing is this has been going on for such a long time. People reported a lot of diseases and illnesses and they said that maybe this is because of the landfill, but it was never really uh, studied. And the other unfortunate thing is it's next to a waste, nuclear waste facility. And they want to make sure the fire is not moving in that direction. But our study shows that it is moving into that direction. <laughs> and so one of the things that, for example, these new technologies, they could actually come in and quickly and fast to basically develop some basic information about the um, study area that you have, where, for example, the size of different piles that are very applicable to the system they have. Here are some of the applications of the new technologies that they exist, that they could come inspect, you know, send you the uh, data that you need. So the next part, I'm going to switch now a little bit more to just urban areas. In environmental health sciences, we have now a couple of faculty members that are working in this topic, and I want to talk a little bit about the importance of it, and what is it that we have done, and what we could possibly do together. So this is the study of the heat-related mortalities. So now we have in urban centers every year a little bit longer period of that heat. It stays around a little bit more. And then it kind of disrupts the system a little bit more. And this is basically the maximum temperature versus mortality. In places that they are used to dealing with cold, they have infrastructure in place to deal with that. For example, in the Northeast, it's mandated to provide heat. As a landlord, if you don't have heat and your tenant calls 311, you get both fined and then they come to you, you have to provide it, you have to put them in the hotel. So that means you gotta make sure that they have heat. But AC during the summer is not part of the equation. And that's why we have this uneven mortality rate. System is not ready, infrastructures are not in place. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to find out how would we develop a high resolution model for different neighborhoods to find out what is this you know, heat doing and how much is it, is it and what are the other systems in urban planning could be used to mitigate this and lower that temperature. So being a satellite guy, I wanted to match the satellite information with some local information. So this was a courtyard around NYU at a time. And then, so we put some sensors on the surface and then this was my building. I put an IR camera and a couple of other cameras. And then we were looking down and matched it with satellite data. And we were able to study different types of surfaces and how heating and uneven heating basically is coming out. And what are the type of systems can mitigate and help? For example, water, vegetation, or a combination of it could be used for design of courtyards to bring that temperature a little bit down. But this is just the beginning of it. Why? Because the population of urban areas is going up. For the first time in 2010, starting 2010, they have more people living in urban centers than in rural areas. That poses a lot of challenges. But also with that comes a lot of data and information. Urban centers are normally very old. You're talking about 50, 60 years of pipelines, and sewer lines, and buildings, and then lead in the water, all kinds of things. But in addition to that, you will have a lot of other information, a number of tweets, number of activities that you have, number of text messages. That could actually give you some information and unlock what's going on. So the purpose here was to find a non-invasive way of monitoring a city. Non-invasive way. If you didn't want to go around and ask people, or touch them, or nothing. What we wanted to do was to find some interesting ways of collecting information on, on people without them feeling being spied on, right? That's the sense. So one of the things that I've done, I put a camera on that building, which was in Brooklyn, looking at the city of New York. And I had to go through a lot of privacy issues to make sure that I'm not getting, you know, structure-specific information, and I'm just generally looking at some features. 
So after putting all that data together, we basically got an interesting curve. Peter going to sleep at 7, Paul at 8, Dr. Fraud maybe at 9, and I decided to stay up until 5 a.m. I was like, okay, so this is the, the pattern. I got a pattern here. City so start basically going to sleep around 7, and maybe at this time, that's the pattern. And then I go to the next day, hoping that same pattern. Pete decided that tonight he wants to stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning just to mess up my data. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the case. I was very upset about it. Why, why, why did they do that? You know, look at this. This is not fun. When I sorted it out again, I got the same pattern. So I concluded basically humans as an individual, maybe they're not a community that can be modeled. But as a whole, they're very much modelable. We behave very similarly. When I sorted that again on Tuesday, I noticed the same pattern. The time that people usually go to sleep and they wake up, and the number of lights. Using a system like this, very simple. It's just one camera looking at a city. You can actually predict financial downturn growth, movement of different parts of that economy. If you had this one in 2007 and 8, based on the number of lights, basically frequency, and the volume of it, we could have seen that a lot of commercial businesses, because this, this, this were able to separate, that the commercials now are less lights coming from them, less windows, that means a lot of them are closing down. So the need for us now, and the need of working together through that, I talked about you know the two schools now, engineering and public health working together. I talked about, showed you that the slide about the um, smart, sustainable smart city center is basically find some new ways, interesting ways, to study human behavior, disease, look at solutions. What can collectively be done to basically navigate through this new area of understanding not just cities, but think about mega cities, how we live in communities that we could work there, you could live there, you could shop there, and minimize your impact and ecological footprint, and have non-invasive ways that they're not violent privacies or anything like that, but collect information and make sure we avoid a lot of disasters and the pain that comes with it. And these are the funding sources that we had over time. A lot of agencies were kind to give us funding. 90% of it went to students. Mm -hmm.